autobiography is not important, but the theology is. And uh, but it's my honor to uh, welcome you as well on behalf of the faculty Why he, here. Why he, uh, one of the things that uh, I picked up years ago from uh, a Canadian broadcast, uh, it was the Vinyl Cafe, and it said, you know, we're not big, but we're small. <laughs> and uh, I love that because it highlighted the, the benefits of being a community like we've been and continue to be here in San Diego. But what we need so that we don't become ingrown is we need the stimulation of some leading thinkers and distinguished uh, people from the larger Christian community. And we've had Gusto Gonzalez and Simon Chan and all kinds of marvelous people here to enrich the experience of our community. And we have another great enricher here today, Julie. Now, I call Julie by reputation and some email correspondence of yours that we've covered that we have quite a bit of common. Uh, both having some roots well, why don't we wait and see if And uh, yeah. then both attending the University of St. Andrews, but with an intergenerational gap between old people like me and young thriving <laughs> scholars like herself. But uh, Julie has um, been involved not only in the uh, academy, but very closely linked to church life. And uh, she's one of those amphibious creatures who gets it on both sides town and gown if you like. And she and her husband have pastored in Scotland for 13 years while raising a family and various animals and things like this. And now they've moved back to the Pacific Northwest to Wenatchee, where her husband has a church there. And Julie uses that as a base for some incredibly innovative things. But what I really appreciate, Julie, about what you've done so far in your career is you haven't dumbed things down in order to connect with real, ordinary life situations. And one of the uh, <coughs> markers of how well uh, Julie has done academically is that uh, she wrote a book on the spiritual theology of John Calvin. Now, it was one thing to get it published, but she won some very significant awards, the Templeton Award, the Christianity Today Award for that. And here's the thing that I thank God for when I read Julie's work. She writes beautifully. <laughs> that isn't always a given you know, with uh, clear thinkers. And uh, so I just uh, thank God for that. And may you get many more things coming out, uh, Julie. And it was a, a delight to, uh, to have you come and share with us here along the lines I'm sure that will illuminate what Jeff has just uh, mentioned a few moments ago about that large quantity of life that isn't directly and explicitly religious. So. Um, welcome, Julie, and uh, we look forward to what you're going to share. I really am so thankful to be here. It's so much warmer here than it is um, back at home, where we are dealing with freezing temperatures. And in fact, um, with the car headlights on, I had all four of my kids last night, you know, two nights ago, picking all of our green tomatoes because it was truly going to do a hard freeze the next morning. So we're all out there at nine o'clock at night, and they're cursing their mother. And <laughs> so to come here, and, you know, this warm, sultry breeze when you get out of the airport is pretty wonderful. I I come to you grateful. I come to you thankful that I'm able to speak to you and to share a little bit of my life journey and how that's informed my theology and vice versa with you. Um, a couple things that you probably don't know about me, Glenn spoke a little bit about them, but my husband and I, having spent 13 years in Scotland, that changed us radically. We went over with our American ideals of what it meant to be a part of a church and lead a church and we came back completely schooled by our tiny little 400-person village. They took it upon themselves to teach us really what it was to be a pastor and to be in ministry, and it changed us. Um, and we did a small, I just, I realize you might not know this, so I'm just gonna put this out there at the beginning. We did a small little documentary about that. Uh, it's 30 minutes. It's, um, this is the study guide for small groups that I published to go along with it, because we put the documentary, put the documentary out there, and so many people wrote to us and said, we want to think more about this, we want to think about it with people in our churches, what do we do? And we also had a ton of extra footage, because we've been interviewing a lot of our professors, 
um, two of our mentors were N.T. Wright and Eugene Peterson, who are amazing on the church and the calling. Um, so we had all this footage that didn't make it into the documentary that I've put into seven smaller, shorter films for small groups. Each one's about <coughs> 10 minutes, and then you can do, I'm just letting you guys know this, because it's so fun to know good, I think this is a really good uh, small group material <laughs> for churches. So it's not dumbed down. I hate to say it. It's not dumbed down. People will really have to engage, but it's not overly informative either. I also don't like small group studies that just beat you with so much information you leave and you can't remember what you've learned. So I brought some of these coffees. They're over there. Um, we're selling them cheaper than you'd find them online, plus postage, all the rest. And also what came out of that experience abroad is my theology of the ordinary. And that's mostly why I'm here today, mm -hmm. to do a lecture now and a lecture this evening on what does it mean that God calls us to live out our calling in ordinary ways, in our ordinary lives. Not that God is calling us to be ordinary, i.e. mediocre, because as Americans we think ordinary means mediocre. I'm going to unpack that a bit as to why we think that. Um, but this, this little book are, is my meditations on that. And I like things short and sweet. So you can actually get through this book. You won't get to chapter three and not be able to finish it. So these are, I've brought some of these as well for you. Um, the last thing I'll say to say into my talk is that this past weekend, my husband and I had the privilege of being at one of our professor's funerals. And it was Eugene Peterson, uh, who's also in the documentary, and just a beloved friend of ours. And what I love so much about his funeral, you know, he's published, he's published 40 books, had printed millions of them, they're in all 200 something languages, um, and his funeral was in the tiny little church in, um, in Kalispell, Montana. They didn't rent a giant venue for it. Um, it was one of those churches that still has the old red carpet, kind of that fabulous, musty old church smell. Um, they didn't bring in some amazing theologian to deliver the eulogy. They just used the, Eugene's current pastor, who happened to be a 27-year-old, super wet behind the ears guy. It, it was wonderful. Um, they didn't fly in some of the many musicians who knew him to do the music. It was just some good old stalwart hymns. And the coffin up at the front of the church was built by his sons. So it just had this amazing, even the funeral made me realize, wow, I must have absorbed so much of this theology just through this man's life. And even in his death, he is refusing to be, you know, a hero. He is just... Being, you know, being ordinary, normal Eugene, passing along like the rest of us. So, uh, so that's my saying into just, I've been mentored by a lot of wonderful people who also managed to be very ordinary and show me how to work it out in their ordinary lives. In fact, when Matt and I were in Scotland in a particularly treacherous, hard part of our ministry there, um, we were corresponding with Eugene by letter, and he said something wonderful to us that has stuck with me. And he said, uh, he said to us, don't worry. He said, um, you don't have to leave the church to find the antidote to the poison. Because he said there's lots of poisons. Eugene was always warning us about the poisons out there, but he was never warning us about the poisons in the world. He was always warning us about the poisons in the church. And, uh, and he, said, you, he, he said, you don't have to leave the church to you know, get your distance from all the poisons. Um, he said the path is to stay close to the church and to be transformed by the Lord of the church. Ooh. Just like staying close to the black sap poison wood, which is a tree in Central America, which can throw your body into a chemical warfare crisis if you accidentally touch the sap. Now what researchers are discovering is what indigenous peoples have known all along, which is that the antidotes are almost always growing very close to the poison. Somehow they've developed a symbiotic relationship. And if you if you have found something in the jungle that is, you know, quite poisonous, you can often find its antidote nearby. Uh, or in this close, in this particular context, they actually share the same root system. The tree that has the leaves that can counteract um, the poison of the blacks, um, the Poisons, I can never remember, black sap poison wood actually can grow right next to it and share the same root system. And this was Eugene's metaphor to me and Matt. He said, 
You don't have to leave the jungle to be healed, and you don't have to leave the church also to find healing. Um, his, his specific words were exactly, the antidote is always near the poison. So this made me relate on all the different ways um, that we can encounter poisons in ministry and toxins um, in the church. And my story that I'm just going to share with you is coming back from being abroad and suddenly for the first time being quite aware of, oh, it seems like there's this culture of extraordinariness that is impacting the American church. Um, not that Jesus can't help us be extraordinary, but, um, but there's this expectation of what a certain kind of spirituality looks like, and it leads to burnout, depression, marital breakdown, all these things that it, it isn't bearing much fruit. But uh, as Matt and I came back home, we began seeing this not only in the secular world, but also within the church, we began to reflect on Eugene's words to us that the church will always have the antidote. Do not, do not fear. And um, so where we began, we're, we entered a church here in America that followed the liturgical calendar. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the liturgical calendar, but some churches orient their whole church year around the great events in Christ's life. Starting with Lent, preparing, no, starting with Advent, preparing for the birth of Christ, moving into Christmas, Epiphany, and then once again, a longer season, Lent, to prepare for, according to the church calendar, an even greater feast, which is Easter. Then you've got the days after Easter, then you've got Pentecost, and then you move into what is called ordinary time. This is one of the first uh, Paschal calendars. It's called, this is from the fifth century. It's carved in, on this giant block of marble um, so that Christians all over the world could start celebrating these things at the same time and be on the same, be walking the life of Christ all together across the world. What I love about ordinary time, and the reason why for me it's been an antidote, oops, it's been an antidote, is that um, ordinary time fills more of the church calendar than all of the high seasons together. And that for me has been a huge lesson. Okay, if in my daily, if in my church and my spiritual life with Christ, more than half of that is just hanging out in ordinary time, I need to settle down and begin to receive this lesson, this antidote that the church from its treasury is offering to me. Annie Dillard says, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. And much of our time, both liturgically and our daily lives, is ordinary. So this talk comes out of an extended meditation. I've been home five years now. Um, I keep pressing into this, trying to press into the roots, um, the roots and also the branches of ordinary time and asking the Lord, what do you have for us in this? How can this be an antidote to the culture that we live in? We can't escape our culture. We can't escape the church. But how can we bring some of this with us into the church? I love this calendar. I found this in France. And I just love it because it's Jesus walking through the church here. Um, and this is the one I use with the children in the Sunday school that I teach. But I just love it. It's not, it doesn't feel like a flat sense of time. It feels like this Jesus striding through our lives, a sense of time. We get to join him in all these different places. Well, what other kind of antidotes, as I was reflecting, does the church offer for some of the poison in our, church, in our culture? Well, I love that the fact that the church has always celebrated ordinary people. And many saints that have been sainted were not sainted for miracles, but were sainted for their sanctity in the midst of ordinary lives. This is a contemporary website called um, Ordinary Saints, I believe. Yep, OrdinarySaints.com. This is Bruce Herman, a Christian painter who's starting a new uh, venture with a poet named Malcolm Geit, and they are co they are combining paintings of ordinary people with poetry. So that's something for you just to look out for, and um, if you enjoy that kind of thing. Okay, that's happening right now, but in the past, the church has always sainted people who were very ordinary. This, and to me, this is part of the antidotes. We gotta remember, these people were called saints, and they did nothing but be a bottle washer. This is Brother Lawrence, and I'm sure when he applied to go to his monastery, he had visions of, of himself on his knees, praying and being holy for hours and hours and hours, and imagine the shock when he arrived, 
and he was made the short order cook of the monastery. And he spent most of his time in the kitchen washing pots and pans. He called himself the Lord of the Pots and Pans. Um, and this, I'm just going to give you a couple of quotes from him. From within this kitchen filled with noise and clatter, he learned to, quote, possess God in great tranquility, as if I were upon my knees in chapel. So he turned his lowly monastic station into a lifelong experiment to, quote, recognize God intimately present with us, to address ourselves to him every moment, whether dishwashing or in community prayer. He learned that, quote, it is not necessary to have great things to do. I turn my little omelets in the pan for the love of God, end quote. After his death, his brothers compiled all his little witty sayings into a book entitled The Practice of the Presence of God. Here's another person, uh, sainted for being quite ordinary. This is Therese of Lysia. She was, uh, she went into the monastic she felt a monastic vocation very early in life and was allowed to enter her local nunnery at around the age 17. But when she arrived, she was overwhelmed with how spiritual and godly the older nuns seemed compared to her teenage self. She wrote in her diary, it is impossible for me to grow up, so I must bear with myself such as I am with all my imperfections. But I want to seek out a means of going to heaven by a little way, a way that is very straight very short and totally new. She went on to describe the elevator that she had for the first time experienced in the home of a wealthy person. Elevators were brand new modern innovation at the time. And she said, I wanted to find an elevator which would raise me to Jesus, for I am too small to climb the rough stairway of perfection. I searched then in the scriptures for some sign of the elevator, the object of my desires, and then I read these words. Whoever is a little one, let him come to me. The elevator which must raise me to heaven is your arms, Jesus. And for this I have no need to grow up, but rather I have to remain little and become more and more. I know. So she fell asleep frequently at prayer. She's considered a great mystic, but she fell asleep frequently at prayer. She was embarrassed by her inability to remain awake during her hours in chapel with the religious community. Finally, in perhaps one of her most charming and accurate characterizations of her little way, she noted that just as parents love their children as much while asleep as awake, so God loved her even though she had slept during the great prayer times. She was called the greatest saint of modern times by the Pope and she died at age 24 of an ordinary disease. Okay, so we've got ordinary time on our side. This is one of our antidotes we've got in our treasury. We've got ordinary saints on our side, but we do have an ordinary poster child, which I, have you, I bet you have not yet thought of, and that would be Jesus. He is our ordinary poster child, although many of us would not think of him at, at the beginning as being ordinary. Now, I bet you want to say to me, wait a minute, Jesus is not ordinary. He was miraculous. He did incredible things. When I think of him saying what he said or doing what he did, Jesus was not ordinary. He's, he's not the one I need to mo uh, model my life after. And in fact, I've often wondered, okay, if Jesus lived today, and my kids and I have often had fun discussing this together, if Jesus had an Instagram account, yeah. could it possibly have had anything ordinary in it? You know, we all have our friends who have these extraordinary Instagram accounts, and then fun friends who just put pictures up of their kids. Well, we were brainstorming, and we wondered, maybe if Jesus is, you know, <laughs> would it look like this? <laughs> Walking across the water could have been captured like this. <laughs> Julie, you are so good. <laughs> or maybe, maybe uh, at his father's house. Oh, <laughs> Maybe though, if he had an Instagram account, 
my kids thought he maybe would have had a private account for his first 30 years, keeping it all under wraps. In fact, I learned about private accounts from my kids through this discussion, so we're, we are following through with that as parents. Um, but, but I've been wondering about Jesus' first 30 years. Would have he had anything to post? As a bachelor, did he have to learn to cook? Did he have B.O.? Like most other teenage boys at the time? Uh, was he an athlete, or was he more of a klutz? Did he have a subject at school that he was particularly bad at? Did he have straight teeth or crooked teeth? Did he play practical jokes on his friends? Did he ever have a crush? Did he know everything that was happening all the time? Or did he have to live in dependence upon the spirit? As I was thinking about how to prepare lectures on uh, theology of the Ordinary. Um, I've organized the book according to chapters um, on the Father, Son, and Spirit. But for these lectures, I want to just focus on the humanity of Jesus um, as our way to more deeply get into this um, appreciation of our ordinary lives. Um, and not only that, but as I was thinking about how are we going to talk about our ordinary lives, I not only thought about we need the humanity of Jesus on our side, but we actually need Jesus, the true human, as the one that we look at. Theologians have always had difficulty figuring out how to talk about our humanity. Calvin begins his whole institutes this way, and he tinkered with the institutes for 30 years, and he begins his confession on his final edition of the institutes. He says, he says, I still don't know. I'm still not sure how to describe and talk about our humanity. He writes, our wisdom consists merely of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. But these are connected together by many ties. It is not easy to determine which of the two proceeds and gives birth to the other. And with this quote by Calvin, we've just stumbled straight into the mystery of the Incarnation. God's life and our life are forever bound together such that we can no longer think of them separately. If you ever have a theology book that starts with the doctrine of God that doesn't really make reference to humans, or vice versa, you've got an incomplete doctrine. Uh, early on in my theological career, as I began realizing I really want to study what, as a Christian, what is an appropriate theological anthropology? How as a Christian do I think about what does it mean to be human? I, uh, I went into our college library and Thanks to the tip of one of my professors, I walked past the books on creation. You'd think that's a good way to begin, our created status, Imago Dei. I walked past all the social scientific books uh, with all of their statistics and behavioral studies, and I went to the section labeled Christology because I realized and I was learning that Jesus is the key to understanding what it means to be human. Jesus establishes what it means to be human once and for all, and he redefines what it means to be human. We are who we are because of who Jesus is. And a central part of Jesus' mission was for us to become human again. Karl Barth says it wonderfully. He says, the one Archidemian point given us beyond humanity is Jesus, and is therefore the one possibility we have of discovering the true nature of what it means to be human. So I know this is a lot of super heavy theology for me to lay down right at the beginning, but we're just gonna we're gonna build from there. We're gonna go straight um, to that place because it's fundamental to our discussion of ordinary life. And we, when we begin to understand that Jesus is essential to our being human, perhaps we can stop longing to be more spiritual, and we can begin to discover where in our ordinary lives Jesus already is. That is the difficult task at hand today. So let's look at Jesus and what he was revealing to us about what it means to be an ordinary human. And what I want to make the case in this lecture today is that Jesus' hidden years, those first 30 years for which he has no Instagram account, no great miracles to show for, Jesus' first 30 years, the hidden years, are part of our salvation. It sometimes comes as a shock 
to us to remember that the majority of Jesus' life was hidden. He spent his life in everyday relationships, needing everyday sleep, doing everyday work, much of it drudgery, punctuated by the joys of being human as well. We often think of Jesus as this miracle worker saying incredible things to people that no one could have ever said unless they were Jesus. But sometimes this is a tactic we use to keep Jesus at a distance from us. We also need to remember that a big part of Jesus' work for us was simply being alive, hidden in a backwater town, far from great rulers, great cities, and great events. And it's during these years that an important part of our salvation was worked out for us in Jesus' human nature. If we rush forward to Jesus' powerful ministry years then, and straight forward to his vital work on the cross, we can have the impression that these hidden years aren't important. So the main question is, not what would Jesus do, but what was he doing for those 30 years? What on earth was he doing for us? I want to make the case today that he was recreating us by his ordinary existence. And I just want you to know that even though for us this is a little bit out of left field, you know, maybe it, half of it makes sense, but you're also thinking, I'm not sure how to fit this in with all my Bible verses on what it is to follow Jesus and um, believe the gospel. This was fundamental for the early church. The first 500 years after Christ, this was core to their belief about who Jesus was and his work for them. So I'm going to quickly jump through four people, two in the very early church. We're going to look at John and Paul. We're going to look at an early church father, 4th century Gregory of Nazianzus. And then we're going to look at a reformer who was a deep student of the church fathers who then came around and saw this very clearly, Calvin. So we're going to look at John and Genesis. Oh yeah, here's my four. And we're going to begin with John. Now, John began his gospel with a very classic once upon a time type phrase. When we hear once upon a time, we immediately think, oh, we know what kind of genre this is going to be. This is going to be a fairy tale. Well, when, when John said in the beginning, everybody could sit back and relax. They could sigh because they knew exactly what was coming. They knew a creation story was about to be told. But John said something with a twist. He said, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. John begins to create this whole new creation story as the story of Jesus, which his Jewish hearers would have thought was very strange. But they would have been alert. They would have known, wait, we're in the territory of a creation story here. In fact, it's a recreation story. And in John's story, we don't have an empty void and chaos and all this stuff that we have at the beginning of Genesis. We have a person who is recreating us from within his own person. So Christ is not fixing something called human nature that he does to us you know, in a distance. He doesn't do it in a transaction over our heads. He is working on his own humanity, and that's how he's working on us. John is the only gospel writer, I think, to really pick up on this. He reports at Jesus' baptism when John runs up to Jesus and says, no, 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 don't baptize me. Um, no, I can't baptize you. I need you to baptize me. John reports that Jesus is very self-conscious about what's happening. John says, no, 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 John, don't worry. I, I'm not sanctifying myself in this baptism. I'm sanctifying them. I'm sanctifying everybody else in me. So John is clear that Jesus' life is part of the new creation project. And John lets us know that Jesus knew it as well. Okay, we've got Paul. Paul also understood this, particularly in Romans. This is where Paul brings it out. I love this door handle of a cathedral in France. Um, Matt and I visited this, and I just thought it was so marvelous. You begin to see this recreation project. This artist is taking us right back to the garden. But instead of the tree of death, you've got this tree of life. Jesus' cross is this new tree from which we can eat life-giving fruit. And this is Paul's message all through Romans, particularly Romans 5, where he talks about the new, the new Adam. 
And the word that Paul used for this was recapitulation. Mm -hmm. Paul understood it this way. Adam was supposed to be the head of the human race. Adam bungled it, and he sent the race off course. And so we need a new humanity headed by a new Adam. Recapitulate literally means to rehead. And so the main point of recapitulation is grabbing our humanity. Jesus is grabbing our humanity and putting it on track again. And God's not doing this again from a distance. God's doing it on himself. He became a part of the new creation. The original creation happened in Christ, and recreation is happening in Christ as well. He is the new Adam summing up all of our humanity in order to bend it back to the Father. Okay, next, the, all the early church fathers, I could put 10 of them up here, but I'm just gonna give you the one uh, who's most famous for having the shortest line. I call it the original tweet. If they had, um, <laughs> if they had iPhones back there, this would have been the tweet that would have been gone around the world. Gregory of Nazianzus has put it this way. He said, the unassumed is the unhealed. And that means, translates, whatever parts of our humanity that Jesus did not assume or live cannot be healed. So he had to take on absolutely every part of our humanity and live it through into obedience. In other words, Jesus became utterly and fully human so that all of our lives, all of our ordinary lives, could be redeemed by him. Okay, Calvin. Calvin flip-flopped on this. He had one answer before he really did a deep dive into the fathers, and then after he dove into the fathers, he came out with a different answer. Uh, at the very beginning of his career, he wrote a brief catechism for Geneva, and at the beginning, the question said, why do you go immediately from Christ's birth to his death, passing over the whole history of his life? And Calvin gave this answer for children to repeat. Because nothing is said here about what properly belongs to the substance of our redemption. But later, having read more of the fathers, he changed his tune. Calvin wrote later, he achieved salvation for us by the whole course of his obedience. Calvin began to understand that these hidden years, these ordinary years of Jesus, were essential for our salvation and our recreation. So, if the Gospels are, are this wonderful new creation or recreation story, I like to read them every once in a while, asking at each stage of what Jesus is doing in different things. What is he doing to my humanity here? If everything he did was actually for the purpose of recreating me, why, this, why did he do this? Why did he do this? Because Jesus isn't just going through the motions of being human to get to the cross. Jesus is fully human in order that we might become fully human in him again. Okay, so we're going to go briefly through four. I, I kind of have seen it as a seven days of recreation. If it were seven days of creation, I call it the seven days of recreation. I'm going to look at four of the recreating events in our life, because um, these are the four of Jesus' hidden years. Um, there's three more that are more public that I'm just going to touch on for a second, but we're going to do a little dive into Jesus' hidden years here. So, for example, I would take the first day, and I would call this, I would call Jesus' birth the first day of our recreation. Luke says in Luke 135, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. I love how domestic and ordinary the incarnation is. If you look at all these other world myths where the gods come down, they are always extraordinary. Nothing is happening uh, in a backwater town with animals you know, right next to you as you're in labor pains um, giving birth. The, this would-be savior is not only being born into poverty, but possibly into a blended family. I mean, this is ordinary. But this is how God works. This is the rule, not the exception. God enters into creation and engages with us there on creation's terms. God uses ordinary created things to bless us and save us and minister to us. God doesn't wish that we were unembodied and in a higher plane with him. 
Otherwise, he wouldn't have created Adam and Eve with bodies. He would have just created them as spirits that he could commune spiritually with. But there's something about their bodies that was important to them. Our bodies are good, and our humanity is good, and it's the place that God has chosen to meet with us. I love this quote by Luther. Luther always says it so succinctly and starkly. He says, the spirit cannot be with us except in material and physical things, such as the word, water, and Christ's body, and in his saints on earth. So if we take seriously the fact that Jesus was born, we need to stop the age-old assumption that somehow this was embarrassing for him, or disgusting. Because we know theologically that the creation is good, and our bodies are good. Having a body was definitely different for Jesus, but it was not bad. It had limitations, um, but it must not be seen as temporary, embarrassing, uh, something that Christ stooped to do um, because of our weakness, and it was abhorrent to him. If God's whole plan in creating us was so that we could be fully inhabited by him, then the Incarnation is a beautiful picture of what humans were designed for. The Incarnation is God's final blessing upon creation, even greater than his blessing in the original, it is good. So take a few moments, just pause and look at this picture and ask yourself, what is he doing to my humanity? strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It is only when we know Paul's word, recapitulation, that these hidden years of Jesus make any sense for us. Why couldn't Jesus have just died as a baby for our sins? Or why couldn't he have come as a fully grown human man and just gotten it over with? Why did he need to grow up? What on earth was he doing for those 30 years? I love this picture. I love it so much that I put it in my book, The Theology of the Ordinary, because this is Jesus and John the Baptist having a play date. <laughs> and they're, they're building something with blocks. I don't know if it's the temple or what, but they're just, you know, you, you so rarely see these pictures of Jesus playing and being a normal kid. And as I began to reflect on what was Jesus doing? What, he was growing up for me. It just helped me to meditate on some of the regular psychological stages of human development. And as I'm going through this with my kids and teenagers and all that, it's amazing to think this was Jesus' same course. He had, to, he had to work his way by degree through the stages of human development. Remember what Calvin said? That he was accomplishing salvation for us while developing as a child? I love, here's a, here's a little bit further what Calvin says. When it is asked, how has Christ, by abolishing sin, removed the enmity between God and us and purchased a righteousness which made him favorable and kind to us, it may be answered generally that he accomplished this by the whole course of his obedience. This is proved by the testimony of Paul. As by one man's disobedience were many made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And indeed, he elsewhere extends the ground of pardon, which exempts from the curse of the law, to the whole life of Christ. In short, from the moment when he assumed the form of a servant, a baby, he began, in order to redeem us, to pay the price of deliverance. 
So it's Jesus' ordinary humanity that is part of our salvation. It wasn't fake obedience. It was a full-on battle. At each stage of his life, he rejected self-will and learned to pray, Thy will be done. Luke tells us he had to grow in wisdom and stature. And Hebrews 5.8 is even more blunt. He had to learn obedience. And the Greek verb is more of a struggle, more of a, um, a literal, literal translation would be to beat his way forward by blows. If it was automatic, could it really heal us? Could it have been, could you say it was even human if it was an automatic obedience? If the unassumed is the unhealed, then he had to assume everything about us. Our self-will, our passions, our whole nature and bend it blow by blow back to the Father again. And just like he needed the Holy Spirit hovering over Mary's amniotic waters at birth to ensure that he was fully human, so he needed the Holy Spirit to obey as a human, just like we do. The crucifixion, of course, being the final point of this step-by-step -step obedience to the Father's will, all of which is salvific. But one thing I love is that Jesus' obedience didn't simply reverse the disobedience of Adam. Jesus gave obedience a new character. He had to save obedience from bad notions of obeying. Remember how we said that we need Jesus to reveal who God is to us? He also needs to reveal who we are to ourselves. And he needs to reveal what true obedience is to us. The motivation for Jesus' obedience is not perfect law-keeping, but it's in relating everything to the Father. It is always oriented towards a relationship. Hymns, even my beloved hymn once in Royal David City, can obscure the nature of Jesus' obedience. You guys probably know this hymn. My kids have to sing it uh, for Lessons of Carols every Christmas. But you know that verse that goes, and through all his wondrous childhood, he would honor and obey, love and watch the lowly maiden in whose gentle arms he lay. Now listen to this part. Christian children all must be mild, obedient, good as he. Anybody have mild, obedient, good children? <laughs> <laughs> this might have us miss the point a little bit. Um, it reminds me of Luther's Away in a Manger, because the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. <laughs> These images hurt us because they are a double standard. They are not the kind of obedience or perfection that the Father delights in. The power of Jesus' obedience came not from his obeying perfectly, and that definition changes from culture to culture, family to family. My kids marvel that of their good friends who are raised by equally good Christian families have totally different things that they get in trouble for than they do. So obedience is cultural and familial. Um, the power of Jesus' obedience came from its character, as being in communion with the Father at every juncture. So take a few moments and ask yourself, Here's Jesus learning a trade. Um, what is he doing to my humanity here? And just keep looking at the foot at the icon while I breathe these words into you. Jesus is teaching my humanity to obey properly from the heart. He is sanctifying all of my life, the life of me, the toddler, my teenage years, my life as a full-grown worker. In all of this, he is sanctifying it by obeying from the heart, bending my human nature back towards the Father. Luke 3.21, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. This is day three. 
And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. What miracles has Jesus done before this? Nothing. Nothing. Jesus has no fame. He hasn't accomplished anything. He's been very, very ordinary. And yet the Father speaks this incredible benediction over his life. I am well pleased with you. <coughs> Often when I'm in a very long stretch of ordinary, which would mean drives to soccer practice, endless meals where the children pick apart what they like and they don't like, and I mean, grocery shopping, ordinary, 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 I need to hear these words spoken over me again and again. They're spoken right into Jesus' ordinary, <coughs> faithful life. And I have two insights that I love to share from Jesus' baptism that have been important for me. Um, again, as I shared earlier, Jesus knew that this was part of our salvation. Jesus went to get baptized for us. Jesus was self-conscious that he was forging a new humanity in his person. He knew he wasn't just dying for us, but that he was living for us. And again, back to the obedience thing, I love how the baptism shows that Jesus wasn't just about fulfilling the rules, ticking the right boxes. That's often how, at least when I was younger, how I was taught to read that he was fulfilling righteousness. But here Jesus is doing something very profound for us. He is teaching our humanity how to be loved by the Father. Because this doesn't come naturally to us. As divine, he came to love us and to save us. But as human, he showed us how to be saved. And he hears words for us that we cannot believe by ourselves. You are my beloved. Calvin often points out that because we're fallen and sinful, we cannot hear the Father's love. It plugs up our ears. And so we instead desire to appease God or do all kinds of weird things in our relationship with him because we can't hear his love. But Calvin says that Jesus had to hear these words for us so that when we are in Christ, we can hear them as if for the first time. This is the hardest part of our discipleship. It seems like the easiest, but it's actually the hardest. Henry Nowen, who was a Yale professor at the time, spent a seven-month sabbatical with a monastic community in New York, and he arrived at a similar conclusion. He realized that a monk's journey into holiness is not into greater and greater feats of self-denial and self-discipline, but a journey into receiving God's love to greater and greater depths. His journal entry in October 1976 reads, to respond to God's love is perhaps the greatest act of faith. This is the great adventure of the monk. To really believe that God loves you. To really give yourself to God in trust. Even while you are so aware of your sinfulness, your weaknesses, and your miseries. I see suddenly much better than before that one of the greatest temptations of a monk is to doubt God's love. Now I'm going to switch from Henry Nowen, having a seven-month sabbatical with monks, to a six-minute video clip um, of some monks that my husband got to know up in North Scotland. It's the northernmost uh, abbey on the British Isles. It's also one of the older ones. And uh, it's the monks of Plus Garden. This is in one of our short little 10-minute videos. And this section on this monk, talking about knowing he's God's beloved, is very, for me very profound. And I think I have to, have to plug this in. Okay. 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 Yes. I'm sorry, I forgot to run this first. So let's hope the sound works. We'll see. Okay.
now I see how Jesus set people free. He went into a particular culture with a particular limitation. So that monk was living in day three of his recreation. He was living there in that baptismal spirituality. So let's just look. Uh, let's look at this picture and ask, what is Jesus hearing for us here? What is he doing to my humanity here? He's teaching my humanity to hear that it is beloved. And he, the true human, is accepting these words with joy for himself and for us. Luke 4, 1 to 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. I think one of the most extraordinary <coughs> things that Jesus did before his ministry and miracle years, during these ordinary years of his life, is that he combated all temptations to not be ordinary. As soon as Jesus heard the Father's love for him, in his ordinary life, he was tempted to be extraordinary. Satan was tempting Jesus to disown his baptism, which was a blessing on Jesus' ordinary life lived in relationship with the Father. Satan's tempting Jesus to prove himself in unrelational ways. <laughs> I think part of Jesus' temptation at this point was to stop being hidden. So what was happening during Jesus' <coughs> hidden years will often be true of our hidden years as well. These will be a battle for our identity. And these years are purifying. Ordinary stretches, long stretches of ordinary are purifying because we often have nothing to show for them. And our culture demands that we perform, we be functional, we, we be productive, and our culture, particularly Christian culture, does not value hiddenness, but being seen and acknowledged, especially for the serious things that we can do as Christians for others. We want to be useful to God. That's not bad. Uh, but we want to influence society. And I know that the millennials feel this particular pressure to change the world. But something interesting happens as we become visible to others. We can easily lose touch with God and with ourselves. Much of our ordinary lives can be places of purification for us. This is the power that comes from Jesus' hidden years. And I love what Henry Nouwen says about this. He says, hiddenness is an essential quality of the spiritual life. Solitude, silence, quiet, ordinary tasks, being with people without great agendas, sleeping, eating, working, playing, all, all of that, without being different from others, this is the life that Jesus lived and the life that he asks us to live. For it is in hiddenness that we can find a true intimacy with God and a true love for other people. So ask yourself here in the desert of hiddenness, what is the temptation? What is Jesus doing to your humanity here? teaching us to resist unrelational ways of living, of doing things for God rather than in God or with God. I don't have time to walk us through the last five days of our recreation, but I'll say a sentence for each day. Uh, at the cross, Jesus crucified the flesh, which was the drive, the spiritual drive within us to be alienated from God. His resurrection in the body is our first shocking glimpse into the fact that our spiritual lives, if they're to be like Jesus, will be more and more solid, not less solid. More and more embodied, not less. And when Jesus ascended, 
He didn't return to the Father as a spirit, but he bought, he brought his transfigured body with him into the Father's presence. God's blessing upon creation and our humanity is now eternal. I love this portrait by Dolly, where he's showing you even Jesus' toes, you know, how, how tactile the risen Jesus is. Redemption is not out of our ordinary life, but in it. So in conclusion, if Jesus is the one Archidamian point given to us beyond our humanity to help us know what it is to be truly human, to have something to see that would help us know what is truly human, what have we seen today? What have we seen about Jesus' years of hiddenness? Jesus is recreating us in part by staying hidden. His hidden years are part of our salvation. Jesus came to reveal God to us in the midst of an ordinary life as he was walking around Palestine at three miles an hour. His work was to sanctify our ordinary life and make it a place of communion with the Father again. And when we live our lives in communion with the Father, Son, and Spirit, our addiction to being extraordinary will vanish. We will be able to identify God's loving presence in the midst of our normal, our daily relationships. We will enjoy being faithful and obedient. And the Lord can do with our obedience whatever he wishes. When we truly press into our ordinary lives, it will address our escapist tendencies that manifest themselves in restlessness and discontent, often with a spiritual veneer of doing new things for God. For the pursuit of the exceptional is often an indicator that we are looking for ways to escape who we are. So the ordinary can indeed be purifying. It requires us, as it required Jesus, to engage ourselves, our limits, our fantasies, and to reintegrate them into Christ. Because when we know ourselves to be loved, we no longer will need to escape. And ironically, when we are anchored in the ordinary, I find that God most often shows up in extraordinary ways. So bringing it back to the beginning, the church calendar is a reminder of this. The church year begins with all of these magical seasons that are high, holy days, anticipations, feasts, fasting, we wait for the 40, 50 days after Easter to get to Pentecost. We get to Pentecost, the fire comes upon us. And do you know that ordinary time begins the day after Pentecost? <laughs> Isn't that just like God? <laughs> he puts us right into the ordinary. He gives us the gifts and then he shoves us out into the desert of our ordinary lives. We don't need to be heroic. We don't need to be Christian celebrities who live anxiously in the insecurity of our fame. We need to be ordinary people filled with the same spirit who lived in Jesus, the truly human one. And just as Jesus, after hearing the Father's blessing, was pushed into the desert of ordinariness, so we are driven often into the desert of ordinary time. But if we stay there long enough, the desert of ordinary time can become its own garden. Thank you. Julie, we want to thank you so much for this. Yeah. And we want to just take a few moments at the conclusion here for uh, some Q&A. Um, but I, I just want to say that I think this was a wonderful example of how Julie and the creative use of art and video, all of this, I think you, you touched our hearts and not just our heads, hasn't you? Mm -hmm. And what a, a wonderful example that is of, of what uh, ministry is really all about. So, so thank you for that. And this is, uh, uh, Janine asked me to just facilitate a little Q&A here. It gives me the right to ask the first question. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking as you spoke about this incredibly difficult thing it is to grasp that, that in our terrifying ordinariness, we are nonetheless loved and 
it can be meaningful to be ordinary. But I was wondering, are we loved because God has this astonishing capacity to embrace what is worthless? Or, or is there something in us to which that he recognizes and therefore loves? Or, or am I just quibbling? I should just take the love and go with it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you help us with that a little bit? Uh, that, that's the only question I have. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful question. And it touches on something I've been worried about for a long time, which is that we often think, we know that God loves us despite ourselves, but we think that he doesn't love us because of who we are as well. We know that he loves us despite our sin, but we don't feel like there's much in us to love. Um, I remember the day in seminary where I went beyond God loves me to the phrase, God likes me. And that was a whole new revelation. That there was something unique about me that God says is not only, you know, only you, but you're the only person who can give me worship in the way you do. You're the only person who can pray in the way you do. And that's why I need you. I want you. I've always wondered, if God has hosts and hosts of heaven who are praising him 24-7, why does he ask us to praise him? But it's because we give him something totally different than the angels can give. What, what is it about our humanness that God delights in and desires and, um, and for him gives him a tremendous joy? And not just humanness, but our unique uh, selves. And I often think that it is our culture's greatest obsession is with uniqueness and authenticity right now. That is the watchword for everybody in and out, out of the church. It doesn't matter what you do as long as you do it authentically. Um, but I, I feel that that authenticity, that desire to be authentic, is one of the greatest, another great resource, or antidote to the poison. Um, that desire to be authentic is found in only in Christ, because when we try and establish our own authenticity, it comes out in wonky, usually bad ways. <laughs> so let me just say, if you desire to give Christ your authentic person, which is what he wants, that is the greatest sacrifice you can give him, you know, Romans 12, offer yourself as a living <coughs> sacrifice, the more in Christ we are, the more authentically we will be ourselves, and the more delight and pleasure he will get from us. So it's a mystery, and it's amazing, and it's uh, something for us to keep stepping into over our whole lives. Thank you, Julie. Who would like to ask the next question? This is Heather. Okay, so I give you something to chew on with the whole being born and that not being something shameful, because you just kind of hear your whole life, like Jesus had to lower himself to humanity to save us. So do you think there's something in that that, like, I don't know, like, I'm thinking of, like, like Pope John Paul's and the theology of the body, and then Christopher West did a whole thing on that. Like, have you looked at that, like, there's this whole shame attached to the body and being embodied and mm -hmm. this, like, even Christian idea that we're just here for a short time, this is not my home, my home is somewhere else. But do you feel like we should shift that thought pattern all together? That like, you know, bringing the king, this is part of bringing the king in here, and bringing, that we should be proud of our bodies, and they are something we're going to hang on to for eternity, or, like, just, yeah, so we're going to take us further. Like, just well, I love, I love how, what you're, you're showing, when we, when we start with this idea that Jesus' humanity was bad, because we are ashamed of ours, so we can't imagine that his would be good. I'm, all of these things I'm concerned about, our shame about our bodies, our desire to, to j just thinking we're here to get a job done. Don't enjoy your body, creation. None of, none of this is for us to enjoy. We just, we're here to get a job done. As I began to see how destructive that was for me, I began to detect that's how we see Jesus. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my theology has been working on Christology trying to look in scriptures, okay, if this isn't true of Jesus, it's we who start with the shame and put that onto Jesus rather than me. So I'm trying to look to Jesus to reverse this, to redignify our bodies, <coughs> our being born, um, our embodiment, even the ascension. That's why I love this dolly picture uh, so much. I mean, it's totally over the top, but it's just like, it's so, you know, like you just want to grab his feet. And, and you don't think of Jesus having toes up wherever he is with the Father. Um, Calvin often says, okay, he is ascended, and he's reigning there, but he says it's not, 
he says we can't think about it in terms of distance because he's actually closer to us because of the spirit than he ever was when he was on earth. So it's this wonderful, the spirit is the one who's mediating us and Jesus' body. I did a lot of my Calvin research on that. Not because I was a huge fan of Calvin, but I felt that uh, I wanted to bring this message to Reformed people, and the only way I could do it was by showing them Calvin really did. <laughs> um, but Calvin's, some of his fundamental moves are so important, and Jesus' embodiment was very important to Calvin. And the fact that Jesus ascended in the flesh means there is a permanent blessing on flesh now and humanity. So I just, I love that. And then communion. You know, suddenly you just, all of this stuff, the fact that we get to participate in Christ's body every week, you know, again, just establishing this physicality of how God is trying to be with us. Another Malkoff effect is that we don't take the Eucharist seriously when we don't take Jesus' humanity seriously. We don't take um, sacraments. Anything happening to our body seems like, well, couldn't we just all get this in our minds? You know, I've made a decision for Jesus. I don't need to do this water dunking thing and take bread every week. But it's so amazing to me that Jesus, all the ways he said for us to be with him are physical. Be with believers. Take this bread and this wine. Dunk your whole body in water. I mean, they seem not important to us, but that's because we live in this virtual, post-enlightenment, digital age where everything kind of happens unembodied. So I think Protestants are really susceptible to an unembodied Jesus because we have... We have that weird spirituality, and then we're also in this culture that doesn't take bodies seriously. So, yes. I was just curious. In Genesis, it says we were created in God's image. Mm -hmm. How does that translate into the humanity with Christ? That's a wonderful question, and um, Paul plays with this when he calls. We are made in the image of the invisible God. We are made, Paul actually says, yes, we're made in the image of God, but we're made in the image of Christ. So Paul kind of reconfigures this and says, I want you guys to think about it this way. And it's kind of like when you read a novel and you look at the end of the novel and you realize, oh, it was there all along. You look at the Bible and you've got Christ as the image of the Father. And even though he comes after this whole Old Testament, he comes at the end you suddenly read back and you realize, oh, Christ is actually the image all along. And we are in the image of Christ. And he is the image of the Father. So that, for me, also is really exciting. I love the Imago Dei. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. Um, but I now had to bring it under my Christology because it actually appropriately belongs there. Systematic theologians are really silly about how they like have to how their brain sorts things into categories and compartments. And you can make lots of bad steps, you know, if you put stuff in the wrong compartment. But that's been very, very instructive for me to also integrate my Christology with this imago. So, and being in the image of God is, um, to me, is one of the most profound ways to see our fellow humans and to inter and to relate to them. Would that then correspond to the love for humanity? Yes. Yeah. Precisely, because we are seeing in them the image of Christ. Not just the image of God, but the image of Christ. And that spins off into all kinds of Franciscan spirituality, Benedictine spirituality, where you greet the stranger by falling flat on your face before them because you believe that you are meeting someone in the image of Christ. Uh, it could be a totally unrepentant heathen, and they would still do it because they believed that person had the image of Christ in them, which is very powerful, especially in our day and age of division. Well, Julie and everyone, um, this has been so rich, and uh, and yet uh, we're discovering that ordinary time also has finite chronological. <laughs> <laughs> but, but wait, there's more. We have tonight. And uh, Julie, could you just take a minute to tell us what you hope to share tonight? Because we'd love to see many of you back if you're able, and to uh, bring people from your church and and uh, really uh, fill the chapel tonight. So uh, what's up for tonight? So it is, it's, I'm going to take more of this humanity of Jesus stuff, but what I'm going to hope to do with it is show people that when we, what happens, it's getting into more of this practicality stuff, what happens when we don't take the humanity of Christ seriously, <coughs> then what, what happens to our lives, and what happens, uh, what do we, how do we look at our own humanity negatively, and then 
it distorts the way we relate to Christ and sanctification. Mm -hmm. So I want to show people two, there's two alternatives. There's a way of relating to Christ where we're not sure about his humanity and ours, and then there's another way that we can walk into a different spirituality. So I'm hoping to show option A and B. And both, you'll understand, are in the Christian tradition um, and have been there for a long time, but I'm hoping to move us out of A and into B. So. <laughs> That's and, and this is all the, the seven days of recreation are in my little chapter in here on Christology. Uh, but tonight's lecture will be fully different from the book. Wonderful. By the way, just before the seven o'clock lecture begins tonight, from 5 30 until 7, we're having an informal alumni reception down underneath the chapel. But the, the dean has extended an invitation to anyone. Uh, like yourselves, who are either friends or students of Bethel, some people are both, and uh, you're welcome to join us, 5.30 to 7, and maybe a couple of conversations about the future of the seminary, which um, is uh, still very much on our hearts, but it's in a, on our hearts still in a hopeful way. All right? So thank you, Julie. Let's express our appreciation. tonight either at 5.30ish or certainly at 7. Thank you.